I do not have PowerPoint, but I have, I don't know how many of you guys know Dr. Lawson. Dr. Lawson, there's what you call the Lawson uh, PowerPoint, you know, like he goes like this every time he's preaching, you know, so that's kind of what um, I will do. Is it on now? Yeah, okay, kid. Yeah, I, I could tell that uh, I wasn't connected. Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, um, Dr. Kevin. Um, there is uh, two individuals, two Iranian individuals, Ahmadinejad and Ayatollah of Iran. They are infamously known for a statement that they um, very regularly made. They would uh, uh, stand in front of crowds and stand in front of TV cameras and they would call for the death of Israel. And they would call for the death of America. They would say, death to Israel, death to America. They are infamously known for those statements, those two guys. Now, Paul gets hold of his writer's pen and he begins to write a book to the churches in Galatia. When he writes this book, what you sense as you read it is Paul is also standing on a mountain peak and he is calling for the death of something. Paul is saying death to self-righteousness, death to self-reliance. That is what the book of Galatians is about. Death to self-righteousness, death to self-reliance. He wants to completely obliterate any ounce of confidence that we have in the flesh. There is no verse in the book of Galatia, uh, Galatians that captures that better than Galatians chapter number 6 and verse 14. I want us to read that text and then take time and think about, you know, how does that, how does that even relate to missiology? How, that, how does that relate to missions? So Galatians chapter number 6, and we will read one verse, just one verse, and, uh, and, and, and take a look at it and find out what the Lord is saying to us this morning. So Galatians 6 and verse 14, Paul says this, Paul says, this is the um, New King James Version, this is the version that the Apostle Paul would read. Um, so, no, just kidding, I... I, I'm, I'm reading from NKJV this morning. Um, I'm a NASB guy, by the way, so ESV, NASB, all those translations. Uh, there's many good translations out there. So he says this. He says, but God forbid that I should boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Now, Paul is making a submission here. In his submission against self-confidence and against self-righteousness, he submits to us three definitive details. Three definitive details that I would want for us to consider this morning. Definitive detail number one, Paul submits to us a strong objection. There's a strong objection that Paul submits to us. Definitive detail number two, he submits to us a very strange object. There's a strange object that he highlights, and I would like us to take note of that. And then lastly, he submits to us a striking outcome. So we see a strong objection, we see a very strange object, and we also see and witness a striking outcome. Please, let's consider these three things together because Paul is seeking to prosecute a case here. And he's using these three definitive details to prosecute his case. He just wants to destroy self-reliance. He seeks, that's his objective. That's his goal. He wants to crush it. He wants to crush any ounce of confidence that we have in the flesh or in ourselves. And I believe Paul is our template. When it comes to missiology, Paul is our template. Um, if, if there's a guy that we can look at and say we want to model after, it's the Apostle Paul. 
We look at his missionary journeys and we look at all that God used him to accomplish and we say we want to walk after these footsteps. So the Apostle Paul had this as a foundation. And if this was his foundation that made his missiology biblical and godly and successful, then we ought to follow after his path. So he says that, um, but God forbid. That's how the New King James translates it. The um, ESV says, far be it from me. The one that is um, grammatically uh, rendered correctly is actually the NASB. But I, I, I picked the NKJV because of the force that it communicates. Because in, in, in literally speaking, it, it is saying, may it never be. Me, me gonoito. Me go, genoito, he's saying, may it never be. But it carries a force of saying, may omnipotence prevent this from ever happening. Now, this is not the first time that Paul employs that formula. In the book of Galatians, he employs that formula in other verses as well. In, in, in chapter 2, verse 17, if you look at chapter 2, verse 17, you will see Paul employ that formula here. He, he just wants to vehemently object. He wants to strongly object something with a lot of force and a lot of passion. So in chapter 2, verse 17, he says, But if while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves also are found sinners, is Christ therefore a minister of sin? Then he says, Megenoito. He says, Certainly not. May it never be. He's saying, Is Christ a minister of sin? Think about the, the weight and the implications of that statement. And he says, certainly not. Megenoito. He is vehemently denying and saying, may omnipotence prevent this from ever being the case. May this never be. May this never happen. So he says that in chapter 2, verse 17, but in chapter 3, verse 21, he says this again. He says, is the law then against the promises of God? Then he says, Megenoito. He says, certainly not. May it never be. God forbid that it would be the case. So these are very strong statements that he's making. And then he is vehemently, uh, you know, objecting to them because of their implications. And so we find him in chapter 6 and verse 14 employing the same formula. He says, God forbid. May it never be that I should boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. There's a very strong objection that Paul submits to us. That's definitive detail number one. The definitive detail number two is the strange object that he also presents to us. What's that strange object? He says, but God forbid that I should boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. He picks a very strange object. It's the object of the cross. And he says therein he finds his boast and his boast alone. No other place in nothing else does Paul say he will boast in but in the cross of Christ. This is Paul's foundation and if this is Paul's foundation, it has to be our foundation. If we are to have a biblical missiology, then the man in the Bible that we see most successful in missions, his foundation would better be our foundation. And so Paul says he finds his boast in a very strange object. It's the object of the cross. He says he will boast in the cross. There's multiple things that men will find to boast in. And Paul says, you list that list as long as you want it. There's only one object. There's only one item. There's only one thing that I find my boast in, and that's the cross of Christ. Men will boast in many things. There's achievements and accolades that people have collected over time, and they will boast in these things. 
We have phrases in our world today, the, the phrase self-made. Say, I'm a self-made millionaire. People say things like that. I am self-made. I, I, I powered my way through. I made it by effort. In Kenya here, they say, mwanaume ni effort. You know, like uh, a man, what defines a man is his, eff his effort and, and just his resilience. That that is what defines you. So they say self-made. You, you, can you cannot be self-made anything. I mean, you look at some of those guys out there, the celebrities out there and guys who, I don't know, maybe they do movies and they do music and they, they call themselves self-made. I can, I can only take that if, if you manufactured your oxygen. Then I can say you're self-made. You know, but, but if the oxygen that you breathe, you, you depend on external sustenance, you are self-made nothing. We, we cannot be self-made anything. There's nothing, honestly speaking, that humanity can take pride in. Because we are all dependent on external factors for survival. And so we cannot be self-made anything. Paul is fully aware of that in the physical realm, but he's also fully aware of that in the spiritual realm. In the realm of salvation, he is fully aware of that. That man can bring nothing to the table. Edward says the only thing that we make contribution is what? The sin that makes this salvation necessary. There's nothing that we can bring to the table that will convince heaven to rescue us. Nothing whatsoever. Paul is acutely aware of that. And he says he will boast in nothing but the cross. What a strange object for Paul to isolate and pick. I mean, there's other, there's other events in the life of our Lord that are, that are more glorious that he would have picked. I mean, he could, he could have picked the incarnation. Think, think, about, think about the glory of the incarnation. God taking upon himself flesh. Think about that. He could have picked that. And there's glory. There's glory in that. He doesn't even pick the life of our Lord that was filled with, 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 with some very um, incredible teaching and incredible miracles. But he isolates this object and he says, I will glory in nothing but the cross. The object of shame, the object of death, and the object of sacrifice. And he says, therein I find my boast. And my brothers and sisters, if that is not the case with us, we will always do missions amiss. We will always miss it. But here is Paul making his foundation known to us. And his foundation ought to be our foundation. So he makes a very strong objection. And then he submits to us a very strange object. But then to my last point where I want to belabor a bit is, is, is he presents to us a very striking outcome, a very striking outcome. He says the antecedent here is the cross. He is referring back to the cross. He says, by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Paul makes known the outcome, the, the impact the cross has had in his life. What has the cross accomplished? What has the cross effected? What has the cross done in his life? He says the cross has fenced him off. He is fenced off from the world by the cross. The cross becomes a fence. The cross becomes a buffer zone that isolates you from the world. What the cross will do is it will effectually um, bring a total, what we call total transvaluation. A very radical reassessment. The cross will cause you to filter everything, everything in life through the cross. You will filter everything in life through the cross. If the church does not do that, red flag. If missionaries do not do that, red flag. 
If Bible schools do not do that, if seminaries do not do that, if theological institutions do not do that, red flag. We must filter everything. Nothing left out. That's what happened to Paul. The striking outcome he, 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 he lays out for us. He says that the cross effectively crucified the world to him. He says, by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. The cross will have you radically reassess things. The, the cross will take what we call the social standards of, of the world and flip them on their head. The cross will do that. If the cross has not had that kind of an impact on you, it calls for self-examination. That you need to lock yourself in your closet and ask yourself what is going on. If the cross does not have that kind of an impact on the people we preach, the, the, the mission trips we make, and the gospel we proclaim, if the cross does not have that kind of an impact on them, we need to sit around a table and ask ourselves what is going on. Because such should be the outcome. This striking outcome should not be unique to Paul. The cross should have this impact on everyone who claims to have been affected by it. That you will be radically, radically impacted. So what will happen is that you will be, essentially you will be demagnetized. Because you know what? Before Christ saved you, the things of the world, the treasures of Egypt were an attraction to you. But once Christ saves you, if the treasures of Egypt still remain an attraction to you, we need to examine that anew. You find new treasure. Christ becomes your treasure. You find a taste for the things of heaven. You find a taste for the things eternal. Your, your taste buds will change. That, that what you used to find pleasure in, you find pleasure in no more. And now you begin to find pleasure in the things that you did not find pleasure in before. So you find pleasure in heavenly things. You find pleasure in the things of Christ. You find pleasure in eternal substance. That's where you find pleasure. There's just a radical reassessment that goes on. Like I said, transvaluation, a total transvaluation. And the things of the world, you are dead to them. And you are alive to God. You are dead to sin and alive to God. You are dead to the world and alive to God. The cross fences you off. It did that for Paul. It should do that for us. The gospel we preach as we go on mission should be a gospel that produces this fencing. This fencing. We must witness that. That's, that's when we say we are witnessing the glory of Christ in the gospel as he subdues the hearts of men and changes their priorities. Changes their priorities. Radically changes their priorities. And now it's the things of heaven that become an obsession. It's the things of Christ that become an obsession. It's not the temporal things of the world. Woe unto you if that is the obsession of your world. If that's the obsession of your life, woe unto you. We sympathize with you. We pity you. If all that you're chasing after, you are chasing after shadows. Chase after substance. Chase after Christ. He radically causes you to reassess everything. And so he, he does fence you off. My brothers and sisters, may, may this be true of us. If this is not true of us, our mission objective will fail. Our mission goals are a waste of time. Our mission goals have no eternal value, no eternal premium at all. If this is not true of us. 
If what was true of Paul is not true of us, we need to re-examine. We need to go back to the drawing board and check again. So that, so that nothing human will overtake this foundation. Because we know the danger of hijacking. Things will begin well. And something somewhere along the line will hijack and, and replace. This should never be replaced. This should always be the case. Paul's foundation is our foundation. He was acutely aware of this. We should be too. So my brothers, when you, when you go through the book of Galatians, remember this is Paul saying death to self-confidence. Death to self-righteousness. He is, he is making a statement unashamedly in front of the whole world. And he is saying, have no confidence in the flesh at all. For your salvation, for your sanctification, and for your service, have no confidence in the flesh at all. Always look heavenward. That's where our confidence lies. Our confidence is in Christ and in his work at Calvary, completed work at Calvary, and that's what we proclaim to the world. And may we witness this impact. May we witness this effect. May this be our foundation in our missiology and in our life as Christians, both now and forever. Let's pray. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for the gospel. We thank you because heaven made an intervention, and we have been rescued. We have been saved. But we have not been saved to just sit on it. We've been saved to serve in different ways, including local evangelistic efforts and global missions as well. Thank you for gathering us here in Kenya, in Africa, to remind the African church of our mission obligation. And we pray that uh, from this gathering, um, a lot of fruit will abound. We will see the effect. It will not just be another conference. It will not just be another gathering. It, 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 will, it will count for something eternal to the glory of your name. Thank you uh, for allowing us to gather. We ask of your blessings upon the rest of the day. May it be productive and beneficial to our souls and to the ministries we represent. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Amen.